you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. What a strange place in our text that we find ourselves in this week. As we looked at our lesson five this week, and this was the very first verse we were given to study, we think, man, this is kind of a weird place to jump right in the middle of it. You figure last week we saw our table server, Stephen. He was standing confidently before this Jewish council. We saw that his courage was palpable. We saw that his serene peace was evident in his face despite all the lying indictments given against him. In fact, his confidence, his courage, his serenity that Stephen uh, possessed was described as having the face of an angel. But yet, here we are in this place where he's calling his accusers stiff-necked. He's calling them uncircumcised. How did we get here? Well, Before we continue, why don't we pray, and we'll look into that today. Father, we thank you that, Lord, you have given us this opportunity to study your word. God, we are so blessed by the fact that we can sit in these homes. Lord, we can be in this place of study freely. God, that we can anticipate the actual uh, teaching of your spirit, Lord, in our hearts and our lives. That this isn't some fantasy, this is our reality, God, and we thank you for that. And we pray, God, that you would speak to us today. And we ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, see, we saw last time when we studied that Stephen was drawn away from a ministry that he was called to by those who were threatened by him. He was drawn away by those who were unable to argue with him. They were drawn away by men who had coaxed other men to lie about him. And then we saw him as he stood before the Jewish council, before the actual high priest of the Jewish council. And then we start our, our study this week with him hurling these harsh words, you, you stiff-necked, you uncircumcised in heart and ears. But what happened? And how did we get to this point? Now, hopefully, you took the time to read the preceding 50 verses of Acts chapter 7, because we left off at the end of 6, we pick up at 51, but there was 50 verses in between there. Hopefully, you took the time to study these words as you continued in your study this week. We find Stephen in a tight spot. We find him in a place where things in the situation around him are rapidly escalating. Now, as usual, when we study God's Word, we need to look into these things as a mirror. God's Word tells us that it is as such, that it is a mirror. We need to seek those things that God would teach us about ourselves as we study this. What application for the purpose of His righteousness in my life is there here for me to find? What am I to gather from this? What am I to gain from Stephen's predicament? We have to be careful not to get caught up in the intriguing narrative that's before us and thereby miss the perfecting and equipping of for good works that God intends for us. So we see in this situation unfolding in the life of this follower of Jesus, we see some commonalities. First of all, Stephen is a follower of Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. Prayerfully, you are as well. We see also in this uh, an opportunity in this commonality between us, an opportunity to learn. Now, we may say to ourselves in our good Christian humility <laughs> and be quick to point out, I am not like Stephen. I mean, whoa, Stephen is a super saint and so on and so forth, and I'm just a lowly guy in a men's study group. But you know what? Let's get past all that obligatory humility in the sense of, of, of drawing attention to it and get it out of the way so that we can be open to the teaching of God's Spirit in the life of a like-minded man in Stephen. If we get caught up on this humility aspect, well, no, Stephen's so much better than me, then we run the risk of not learning from his life. We have to understand that he is a man like we are who loves the Lord, who follows the Lord, and therefore we have an opportunity to learn from him. 
As I said, we find Stephen in a hot spot, in a, in, on the hot plate, if you will. He's being lied about. He's being detained. He's being disputed with. He's being looked down on. He's being hated Now, much of this may sound, in fact, familiar to us. We may have found ourselves in one or more of these situations in times past. To be hated, to be looked down on, disputed with, to be lied about, maybe even to be detained on certain things. So much of this sounding familiar, let's see what it is, in fact, that he does. Now, as I mentioned on the onset, that we're jumping into an event at this odd spot. So let's back up a little bit. If we look back at chapter 6, right there at the very last verse, it says here that all who sat in the council, they looked steadfastly at him, and they saw his face as the face of an angel. Then the high priest in chapter 7 said to him, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. Brethren and fathers, listen. Stephen, having been snatched up after this dispute with the synagogue of the freedmen, he finds himself facing false, scathingly false accusations. Now, we know, because we've been reading this and studying this, that the only thing that Stephen is guilty of is truth. He's guilty of faithful service. He's guilty of miraculous works. And now he's given an opportunity to speak. They say, are these things so? We have to notice, as we look at this scripture, the demeanor of Stephen. If we're to learn anything today from this account, we have to begin with his demeanor. We were told that his face, as, he had the face as the face of an angel. That is to say that his face, his countenance, exuded confidence, courage, serenity, peace. An angel is a messenger from God. He he stood there as a man who had a message from the Lord. We have to recognize that as Christians, our instruction is the same. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. We can't miss the urgency of that verse. The Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. There's an urgency to the gentleness that people need to see. There's an urgency to uh, present ourselves in a way that displays the fruit of the Spirit because the Lord is at hand. In other words, it's their souls that are at stake. It's important that we understand that there is nothing more important to God than the souls of men. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Now, when lies come at us and we we get people that are coming against us and they are, are resisting us and they're debating us and they're looking down on us and being condescending and stuff, oftentimes our first reaction can be that of defensiveness. Who do you think you are? We can get indignant. Oh, you, you're not going to go there with me. We can get angry about it. Like, are you kidding me right now? Look, look, dude, this is not what we're doing right now. And we can get all caught up in our pride. But the question becomes, what? For what? To what avail do we allow this to happen in our lives? That, that if somebody resists us in the Lord, that we would get indignant. What good can come from that? God says, let your gentleness be made known. We see the confidence, the courage, and the serenity in Stephen when this has happened. We also have the example that's set before us, the example in Christ, the example that Stephen is displaying. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, speaking of Jesus, it says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth. Also in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, he says, For to this you were called, Peter says, you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us the example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, But yet when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, 
He did not threaten, but yet he committed himself to him who judges rightly, righteously. And this is what we see Stephen displaying. We see Stephen in his spirit, he's led by courage. He exudes confidence, not arrogance, confidence. A serenity of peace that enabled him to not open his mouth to their outrageous accusations. But what he does do, however, is he opens his mouth to God's truth. If you had read, you would have seen that in, in verses 2 through 50, Stephen gives this spot-on history lesson. Man, he, he's given the floor before the high priest, before the high council, and he jumps right in and goes all the way back to Father Abraham and works his way forward. He talks about God's first words to Abraham. He talks about the birth of the patriarchs, the covenant of the circumcision. He talks about their bondage in Egypt and the birth of Moses. He, he gets into some of the details of Moses' life. He even get, touches on their miraculous deliverance from Egypt and slavery for 400 years. He, he talks about Israel's rebellion against the very, the very one who delivered them. He mentions the tabernacle that they were instructed to build and they took with them and they kept it uh, all the way through till Joshua conquered the land of Canaan and they still had it. All the way through to their very King David who Stephen mentions had favor with the Lord. He mentions Solomon building a temple for the Lord and that God declaring that his throne is heaven, his footstool is the earth, and that everything belongs to him. The very, it's a very thorough history lesson that he gives these men indeed. In fact, this is nothing but truth that Stephen brings. The question becomes, when we ourselves are being lied about, detained, disputed with, when we're being looked down upon, when we're experiencing hatred, do we ex display the courage, the confidence, the serenity, and speak in the truth that God has called us to? This is what we are to be learning today as we've studied this, this week as we're in this study. Display courage, display confidence, display peace, serenity, and to be speaking only in truth. And then we come to the verses where we picked up this week. These words that come directly from the Lord through the mouth of Stephen to the ears <clears throat> of these religious leaders, to the ears of these power hoarders, if you will. Look in your Bible at verse 51 of chapter 7. Verse 51 of chapter 7 says this, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. Who have received you have, are, you have received the law by the direction of angels, and you have not kept it. As Stephen gave the history lesson, this is what you might imagine. Can you imagine Stephen there before the high priest, there before the council, and he's giving them this history lesson, this extensive history lesson, and you can imagine their disgust and their disdain as they listen to this table server, this table server, instructing them in the things that they already knew. You presume to school us? We're the leaders. We're the religious leaders. And you presume to school us. Stephen cuts to their hearts. He calls them stiff-necked. You're stiff-necked. That is to say that you're stubborn. You're characterized by inflexible persistence. Your unyielding attitude towards truth. Your unyielding attitude towards things that you in fact are wrong about. You insist on your righteous 
your righteousness. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. They insist on that right. He says that they're uncircumcised in their hearts and their ears. In other words, there are those whose, whose soul and, and their senses are completely closed to divine admonition. They're not listening to the Lord. Their flesh is in the way. They have not removed that flesh. They have not circumcised that flesh to hear from the Lord. Now, bear in mind, these words were more than just some arbitrary accusation. This wasn't just some fancy way of saying, you guys are, are, are stubborn and you don't listen to the Lord. This is what it meant, but there was also a deeper meaning to it. This is the same description that was given to rebellious Israel way back in Exodus chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses in chapter 33, verse 5 of Exodus, he said, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. And again in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 13 it says, furthermore the Lord spoke to me saying, I have seen this people and indeed they are a stiff-necked people. Now understand that these religious leaders would be familiar with Exodus 33 5. They would be familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 13. They would know that these verses were specifically referring to a time when people had defi- the people had defied God by making a molded image. After they had been delivered by the hand of God from Egypt, their rebellion was so grave that it stirred God to seek to destroy them. This is the historical implication intentionally sought by Stephen in his language. He would know, Stephen would, that this term would draw their understanding, the understanding of his audience, back to this time. And they would understand it, and the meaning would be clear to them, and the severity therein. This term, uncircumcised in their hearts and ears, that too would hearken them back in history to their people, that they as church leaders, they would be keenly aware of this. It's a term used repeatedly by God throughout the Old Testament to refer to the condition of unfaithfulness, of rebellion, of arrogance in the heart and of guilt. This high priest in this council would know that Leviticus chapter 26 verses 40 through 41 say, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness, which they have been unfaithful to me, that they that they also have walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies if their uncircumcised hearts were humbled and they accept their guilt. An uncircumcised heart, by, according to Leviticus, is that of unfaithfulness, contrary walking to the Lord, arrogant, guilty. And the high priest and the council would know this. They would know this is why Stephen chose these descriptors of them. And Stephen continues to pour it on, and he tells them, you, you. Before he was saying our, but now in these verses 51 and on, he he begins to refer to them not including himself. He says, you always, that is to say, you incessantly, without interruption, resist the Lord, the Holy Spirit. You resist him, you're adverse to him, you oppose him, you strive against him. As your fathers did, so do you. In chapter 7, as we studied, in verse 39, Stephen mentions their forefathers not heeding to Moses. He said in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. This table server, this table server from this rebellious sect of Christians, those found in the way. He's speaking to the high priest in this manner. manner. And this to the high priest would be a tremendous affront. It would be incredibly insulting. He draws their attention. He draws the attention of this council and this high priest 
to the tradition of persecution and murder that their forefathers set forth and that they themselves are continuing in. Your forefathers, they murdered the prophets. They persecuted the prophets. And you're still doing the same thing. You're continuing in it. Stephen is lumping these Jewish religious leaders in the same category as those they were taught to understand were the worst of the worst. You're the same. Their forefathers killed anyone who foretold of Jesus' coming. And they themselves went up to their forefathers by actually killing the very Jesus whom they foretold. They were no better no better than those who had gone before them, no better than those whom, had, whom God had rejected. You hear that? He's telling them, the high priest, he's telling the council, you were no better than those that you have studied about that God rejected. No better. They betrayed and murdered the very one God foretold them of. The one God had promised them would deliver them set them apart, the one that would usher in God's glorious kingdom. Their power-grabbing arrogance and their short-sightedness reduced them to the lowly status of those who had gone before them, doomed to repeat and intensify the same sins. Stephen is still only speaking truth in the face of persecution. He's only speaking truth. And we saw how they reacted. Look at in verse 54. In verse 54, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. We had looked a couple of weeks back at that cut to the heart, what that means. They were, they were devastated inside in, in their souls. It's interesting because this, they gnashed at him with his teeth. This is an expression of extreme rage and of extreme torment over what they heard. In fact, it's interesting to note that in Luke 13 and in Ma- and Mark- Matthew 13, that this is a, as a description of people's condition in hell. That gnashing of teeth, that weeping and gnashing of teeth. They were in anguish over the things that Stephen had accused them of. This whole scene is playing out before us, and it's in a full context of everything we've been studying thus far with the miracles that they were seeing going on with the apostles, the the things that were happening by way of, of, of them being delivered from prison and so on and so forth, the conversations that they've had with Peter, all of this stuff crashing down on them all simultaneously. And now it's just, yet this, now Stephen, a table server? Are you kidding me? And this torment just builds and builds. But yet we still see Stephen, teaching us how to respond. Through all of this, Stephen is still showing us how to respond to opposition. How do we, you and I, today, respond to persecution? With courage, with confidence, with serenity, with truth, and also focus. Look at what happens in the next two verses. Verse 55, it says, But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Look, look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is such a beautiful thing. And I want us to understand what's going on here. It says that Stephen being full of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is kind of a cool thing to note because it says Stephen being full of the Holy Spirit. This is not a new statement in regards to this man, Stephen, to this man who serves in his church by waiting on tables and ministering to the body's needs. This observation was made of him in chapter 6. All through chapter 6, verse 3, Verse 5, verse 8, verse 15, filled with the Spirit. Wouldn't it be great if when somebody described you, if somebody described me, that repeatedly they would say, he's filled with the Spirit. That constant description of us 
should be thusly as well. He's filled with the Spirit. What a tremendous thing. It says that he gazed into heaven. Gazed into heaven. That literally means this. One, that he looked up into heaven steadfastly. But it also means something interesting here in the sense that it says, when you look at that definition, it says that it's metaphorically. He looked up into heaven metaphorically. That is to fix one's mind on as an example. Where did he put his focus? He put his focus on heaven. Oftentimes we'll say, well, I just, I need to look to Jesus. I need to, to look to, unto the Lord. I have to look, gaze into heaven. I have to, and, and, and we're like, but yeah, but I don't see him. No, this is an idea, an understanding of focus. Where is your heart? Where is your mind? Where are you dialed into? And is it on heaven? Is it on the Lord? Is it on God? Is it on His Spirit? Is it on His Word? Is it on the things of God that will perpetuate godliness and power and courage and confidence and peace and truth in us? Stephen was focusing on the example of Jesus. His mind was stayed on Jesus, and as a result, he could see what was expected of him. He saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen's laser focus on the Lord and his position in faithfulness afforded him the privilege of seeing this glorious sight. You know, when the scriptures in Philippians describe that, that peace that surpasses understanding, that, that peace that is not dependent upon things being peaceful, that understanding that the joy, as we talked about in our study this week, uh, last week, uh, joy being, it's not a matter of being happy, it's a matter of having a certainty and an understanding that God is in control. Having that countenance, that peace that is, that is attached not to circumstances, but to our Creator. That's the laser focus that Stephen had. Such a beautiful vision in its extraordinary wonder. This would set his heart in order and, and full of joyous awe, and it would prepare him to endure what was about to happen. Stephen is teaching us today we need to have courage. We need to have confidence. We need to have serenity. We need to speak the truth. We need to have focus in the face of being lied about, detained, disputed with, looked down on, and hated. Look what happens next. In verse 57, Then they cried out, the, the high priest in that council, cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. The resulting chaos is horrifying. What happens now is, is nothing but rage personified. The rage in these men was that which stirred them into an inaudible frenzy. These grown men were literally covering their ears like children, not wanting to hear what was being said any longer. La, 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 we can't listen to this anymore. They charged at Stephen in unison, all in agreement that he must be stopped, that he must be shut up, that he must die. And this scene turns immediately violent and hectic. The screaming and the undiscernible objections and the protests that started simply before the high priest and the council, now it spills out into the streets of the city as they force Stephen out of city limits. And all around would, all those around would doubtlessly see and they would wonder what is going on. And they would witness this one man being shoved along by the high priest, by the council, being yanked and pushed along violently by these religious leaders whose faces would be distorted with rage. This scene would attract attention as it worked its way through the city streets, perhaps even building a crowd. As it, and the, the crowd would get larger the further that it went. This man, Stephen, who was filled with God's Spirit, he woke up that morning prepared to serve in the ministry that God called him to 
as he had done previously. This new position that was prayed about, he had his hands laid on him and, and prayed over him with six other men to do this ministry, to serve and make sure that nobody was neglected or over, overseen. And he served for a portion of that day, as he always had. He distributed to the needs of those amongst the brethren. In the course of his service to the God that he loved, he, as we're told in the scriptures, he performed miracles. He, he performed wonders. And he talked with those who had questions about the truth of the gospel that he would share. And as day went on, he found himself before the chief priest, giving testimony of God's faithfulness, the history lesson, and, and the, uh, talking of the coming of Jesus. But now, he finds himself dying, being slowly and violently killed on the outskirts of the city in which he lived, on the outskirts of the city where the inside of that city was the bed that he got up from that morning. And every stone that makes contact with his body takes an incremental piece of his life with it, slowly, painfully, Brutally, his life is being taken from him. And this is how his day will end. His last day. His life. Now, doubtless, he did not expect that this would happen today. When he opened his eyes to face a new day that morning. We need to understand today that we never know what the day will hold. We never know what it will bring. But we must be ready no matter what. Courage, confidence, peace, truth, focus. The witnesses mentioned here literally means that, that in the process of stoning, because there was a procedure, the witness of a stoning had the responsibility of pushing the man down and, and casting the first stone. And for this, they would need somebody to carry their large flowing robes that would get in the way so they could get a good toss. We see here that they laid down those robes, those, their clothes, at the feet of, the, of a young man named Saul. And those of us who have been a part of the Word of God for any length of time, we know who this is talking about. This is Paul the Apostle. This is what we call in the comic book world his first appearance. We know that Saul, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, says that he was consenting to the death of Stephen. Paul himself said, this I also did in Jerusalem, in Acts 26, verse 10, he says, and many of the saints, I shut up in prison, he said, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, he says, I cast my vote against them. We can understand from this that Saul was not simply, you know, the, the, the coat bearer. He wasn't simply the, the guy at the, at the beginning of the nightclub that takes your hat and coat. No, he was a guy that was voting for the death of Stephen. We have the first appearance of Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul the Apostle. And this account of his role in the death of Stephen will play a crucial role in his conversion experience later on. But that's for another day. Look at verse 59. In verse 59, it says that they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen was keenly aware among the violence and the brutality and the chaos of what was going on that he was dying. And in seeing the Lord Jesus at the right hand of God earlier in verse 56, Stephen confidently resigns his spirit to the hand of his Lord. We know that the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's that confident peace despite the violence. And look at how the chapter finishes out in verse 60. Then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. And we have to understand today, my brothers, this that Stephen's character was reflective of the God that he worshipped. 
no matter the circumstances, no matter what his situation was, his character, his integrity, his reputation was always reflective of the God that he worshipped. In fact, his words right there at his death were reminiscent of the words of his Savior, Jesus, from Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they, know, for they do not know what they do. This wasn't a coincidence. This was a man who followed Jesus. I wonder how often when we're talking about different things, situations in life or whatever, that our first thought is what Scripture says. And we speak it as though it were our own words, because it is our own word. God gave it to us. It's his words, but he gave it to us. And we speak it because that's how we think. It's what we know. It's what we study. We're students of the word. We're lovers of God. And it just happens when we speak. This is a graphic example of the heart of a man who is a follower of Jesus, who when faced with unimaginable circumstances, dire unto his very life, still has the overwhelming spiritual wherewithal to properly represent the one that he loves. Do we do that? Do we properly represent the one that we love, whose name, by the way, we are called by? What we see in Stephen, and hopefully in ourselves, is an outpouring of a pre-existing state of heart. As the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do not charge this sin to them. His only response could be on behalf of the lost, not to curse them, not to ask God to, to destroy every one of them, to remember who's throwing these rocks and kill each one of them, destroy them, turn them into frogs, do whatever it is that you do. No, it is not to curse, but to plead for mercy and to leave open the opportunity for them to be forgiven and saved. His example, the example that is meant to teach us today, the example he learned from Jesus is our application for today. In the face of being lied about, being detained, being disputed with, being looked down upon, being hated, we have to be those, my brothers, who are courageous, who are confident, who are serene, who speak the truth, and who are focused on the Lord. This is what's expected of us. This is where our character thrives and where Jesus is seen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how much you love us. God, we thank you that you bear open before us the life of this man, Stephen, the life and death, that you've given this to us for our learning. God, we would pray that we would never be in this situation. That we would never have to be those who endure this type of death. But God, whatever it is that you have for our lives, no matter the end, no matter the living until then, I pray, God, that each one of us would be those who display this character, who gaze up into heaven, who have that focus, that brings us that peace that surpasses understanding to endure whatever it is may come. And we ask, God, that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen.